I'm thrilled to be joined by our CTO, Guy Duncan. Guy, thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? I'm doing well. Really, really nice to be here. And uh, we've got a beautiful day here in London, a nice, beautiful, crisp fall day. So, um, yeah, and a lot of things going on at Tide. So it's really, really nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. It is a very sunny day. Um, by the way, we are both in London. Um, if anyone uh, wants to share where they are in the world, would love to know. Uh, let us know. Hopefully it's sunny where you are as well. Well, I know for our uh, friend watching us from India, it's already 6 p.m., so it might not be as sunny, but let us know in the comment. We'd love to know where you're watching us from. Um, it's fantastic to have you, Guy, and we have a packed agenda today. We've got loads of stuff to, to talk about, and I'm really excited about it. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that these live Meet the Team Really events are designed to introduce Tide leaders and give you an exclusive behind-the-scenes look um, into our company culture, what we're working on at Tide, how the teams are working together. Um, in our last LinkedIn Live, I was chatting to Lisa, our CIO, and for anyone watching us today that is either thinking of joining Tide, thinking of applying, or is in the process, I'd highly recommend uh, watching the recording after after this is after this is over because Lisa gave some some great tips around um, how to best prepare your application for Tide and to tailor it to Tide, and then also she gave some uh, amazing number. Guy, I don't know if you if you if you were watching us, but she shared that uh, there was a total. Um, you know, a few months ago, we would get cross teams, cross jobs, about 8,000 application a month. Mm -hmm. Since April, May, this has uh, jumped to 30,000 application a month. Wow. So, yeah. you know, and the team really is, uh, you know, working on this. We've put, put, you know, put new processes in place and we really are going through every application but please do bear with us uh, for the one you know watching us and that are applying because uh, you know this is a, a very very lengthy process we do uh, you know take very very careful attention to get the the right fit for the team right and uh, and so I think she shared that 0.3% of our applicants gets offers. So, you know, do continue to to send over your applications, but just, you know, bear, bear with us when, um, when you're within that process. So, um, and we do have other fantastic, um, you know, LinkedIn lives. We had one with Gujar or India CTO, so, uh, CEO, sorry. So you can uh, just check those out on our blog. Please do. Um, but yes, let's just you know, jump right in because we do have a hacker agenda. Today, I'm joined by Guy, our CTO. So we're going to talk about your role as, at Tide. We're going to talk about how you enable the team, you know, the tech team to achieve their goals, giving them the best environment, um, you know, discussing your leadership style, your vision of work-life balance, your interpretation of it. And also, you know, what you're most excited for at Tide uh, in the coming months, weeks, years. Um, so let's just jump right in. And also, please do bear in mind that the comment box is here to, um, to get um, your thoughts on, on what we're saying. But also, we will dedicate 15 minutes um, at the end of this live to questions. So please put your questions for, for Guy um, in the comment box. We'll address them. In, in the end. Um, so let's just jump right in, Guy. Um, I wanted to know, because you're a technologist, you're a former dungeon master, you've been in different CTO positions, uh, you've been tied CTO since September 2019. Um, right. Can you tell us about your journey? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've, uh, I've always been a technologist. So if you go back to when I was a little kid, um, you know, and this is a long time ago, right? So um, I was very, very into Dungeons and Dragons. <clears throat> and my father was a professor at the university. I grew up in a place in the U.S. called Omaha, Nebraska. So right in the middle of the, of the, of the country. And Omaha is a city, about a million people, but then it's surrounded by cornfields and right. it's very rural and very remote. <clears throat> um, but, it, but my father was a professor at the university and he, he was a professor of fine arts, but he was entitled to um, mainframe computer time. So they were, you're talking, you know, long time ago. So this is like mid seventies, right? right. I really, I really aged myself. And so um, I was really into Dungeons and Dragons. So 11, 12, 13 years old, that time of period, uh, my brother was four years older. And what we would do is we would actually program in punch cards 
right. the, the okay. Dungeons and Dragons game, and then we would put the punch cards in a wheelbarrow, and then we'd roll it up to the university, and we'd run those punch cards through the mainframe, and then we'd sit there and wait, and then it would print a dot matrix paper, and then that would tell you what happened. And it was, wow. you know, and, and the only time we could get that computer time was usually in the in the middle of the night. So like one in, one in the morning. So I would talk to my dad and say, hey, dad, we want to take these, run these through the computer program. And then we would walk to the university with the wheelbarrow and we'd run the punch cards through. And then we would wait to usually take about, it depends how many jobs they had on the mainframe. The punch, the uh, program would come out, we'd read it. And then at the end, I would go, oh my God, you killed my red dragon. <laughs> and that was then that's really what we were doing so that was my kind of this first is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, this that, is... that, was, that was my first foray and i think the importance of the story is that i've always been connected to technology to solve problems okay. and i've always been connected to uh, technology to answer questions and to help mm -hmm. facilitate things in particular like things that were abstract so i continued you know all the way through university being a dungeon master Dungeons and Dragons, and just loved it. Loved the storytelling and the imaginative. And I just always incorporate. I would always write programs. Eventually, you know, I got a Mac. So you know, and and then and then at university, you know, just a long story. Um, at university, um, I wanted to study computer science, but at that time, in order to study computer science, you had to spend two years at university studying um, electrical engineering. Okay. And I didn't, and I didn't want to study electrical engineering. I wasn't interested in that. And so I, instead I studied mathematics and I studied logic, philosophy. So philosophy, but it was actually symbolic logic and symbolic logic ends up being the basis of modern computer programming language. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, modus tollens and all that. And I, I really, really excelled at it. And then make a long story, you know, I did small talk and um, got into management, built my own company in the late nineties, uh, worked, built the first internet voting uh, platform used in binding real elections. And so I've been at this a long, long time. And so I, and then I fully moved, started moving to SaaS and um, basically moving to SaaS and cloud actually in the, in the late, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010 kind of time frame is when yeah. I started dabbling in it, fully moved over in like 2013 about 10 years ago, moved to Europe. Right. I've been in Europe, Europe, Europe for, for the, since then and um, have worked, you know, for companies like BMW. I was mm -hmm. the global CTO at BMW, mm -hmm. running the BMW Connected program. I lived in Amsterdam and was the global CTO at PayU Naspers, which is, right. PayU's got a really big brand in India and also in emerging markets in terms of payments, um, acquiring PSP type play. Yeah. And um, I'm just, a, I'm a serial CTO. I'm a serial I'm really happy in the technology space. I know a lot about product and product engineering, but I'm one of those people who I get up in the morning, I think about APIs. I think, right. about, I think yeah. about technology. I think about security vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, and I think about the value that we're trying to build here at mm. Tide for our members, right? That's really also pretty obsessive for me is how we can give time back to our members. Yeah, and I love that. And I think that's really the glue between all the teams, right? We are all, uh, we all have our different focus and objectives. But you know, the main common one is saving our members time and money and the passion for SMEs, which is um, truly fantastic. And, you know, as an ex, um, you know, business owners, I think it also shapes your mind into how can I best solve this problem yep. for, for my peers, right? Um, and, and one thing that's really striking about your journey is the evolution of tech through throughout your your um, you know your career and, and how so I, I I used to love asking um you know our colleagues how do you keep on top of you know your field and making sure you, you you're always on top but like in this you need to just you know continue learning every day and I think we'll talk a bit more about this about learning and sharing your knowledge right but I think this is truly um outstanding as well in in what you just shared um one thing I wanted to go to in in a bit more details is you said you you know you've been in Europe for 13 years you worked for very big companies joining Tide uh, back in 2019 it was a smaller team uh, we I actually looked at numbers when you started we had 109 technologists we have 261 today mm -hmm. you know that's that's a huge growth and it does 
definitely reflects the, the, the rest of the business growth, right? But um, I really wanted to ask you, you know, how you enable uh, the team to develop, collaborate, achieve their goals, uh, really. Yeah, so um, I think that culture is so important. So um, working at a, a large, large companies, right, at uh, BMW, you know, is li literally, you know, tens and tens of thousands uh, in excess of 100,000 people. And I think working in that experience at, at that type of scale, I realized that, you know, I could have influence. I could, you know, I was really enjoyed that experience. I love the company, love the brand, right? I'm a real car guy. I really love it. But I wanted to be, have more impact. And I wanted to have more impact in terms of mission and purpose. That was extremely important mm -hmm. for me. And if you look at what Tide's doing in terms of its mission and purpose, we're really focused on the long tail. We're focused on small businesses and we're focused on those, you know, one employee, sole proprietary, two, three employees. And let's just be honest. I think all of us have awareness and who have ever anyone on this call or anyone on this LinkedIn, LinkedIn event, if you've ever opened a business and you've ever tried to get a bank account, you know that it's just traditionally been pretty painful. Yeah. Banks are really optimized there. You know, most banks have a consumer business. They have a consumer label. They have a B2B label. And then their B2B offering typically is for big businesses um, because that's, that's where the money comes from. So Tide, we're doing something really different. We're really focused. First of all, we're just focused on B2B. We're just focused on serving business customers. We're doing it in a data, uh, uh, digitally native context. In other words, all of our technology, all of our offering, all of our digital touch points are all digital. So inherently, we're kind of living at those digital points. Yeah. And then what we're doing is we're investing in that long tail. So we're basically trying to make it easy for small business owners to run their business, to focus on their passion and their purpose in terms of their business. And that Tide can take care of things for them. So what does that mean? What do, how does that translate? Well, it translates into some literal, literal things. So like one is platform. You know, the platform, the Tide platform. It needs to be reliable. It needs to always be available. It needs to have high levels of security. It needs to be like a dial tone. In other words, we need to be a trusted partner so that when you have this device, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you've got this device, by the way, that we've got this cool razor. So it's really cool phone. But oh, um, cool. Uh, I was um, wondering what that was. Yeah, yeah I wasn't sure if it yeah. was a phone or it's not. A, yeah, it's a, full, it's a full Android phone, but it's got the razor and it's you can you can use the small screen on the outside and then you've got the full experience of android on the inside right so right. yeah so that's anyway but but our, our our that's where our customers are the customers are on these devices mm -hmm. and so we need to have that reliable experience and we need to be as reliable and as consistent and as available as like a google right because that's what the expectation is and so that's the first kind of barrier to entry and then it needs to be secure and then we build the use cases on top of that to really focus on giving time back whether that's issuing an invoice or it's paying a bill um, or it's basically managing your money or filing your taxes. It's about really building those experiences, but not doing it in the context of a large business. Right, yeah. Doing it in the context of a small business. And so we're really, really focused on that. And we're really focused on giving time back. So we really are optimized in providing them that service. And I believe, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but I believe that if we do a good job there, we can really contribute to the success of that small business and we can help keep them open. Absolutely. And I think we are also developing a range of tools that are designed exactly for that, right? To support right. The, the, the business and the owner of this business in every step of its uh, business admin, really. Um, and right. Really, Guy, can you tell us how, like, how you leave those, uh, how you enable this, uh, you know, this mission and, and those different steps, uh, you know, connectivity, accessibility, security within, within the tech team? How does that, how does yeah. that work? Yeah, so within the product engineering community, right? So you you know we've we we at Tide we practice agile. We do we yeah. do we do Tide's flavor of agile. We do some things that are very Scrum oriented. We do some things that are very Kanban oriented, but we kind of mix that way. The thing that we really try to empower at Tide, and it's something that we work on every day, is we work on serving the team. So mm -hmm. I really embody the model of servant leadership. And I really try to basically serve the team. And in my mind, always, you know, if you look at a kind of an organizational design, the teams are at the top. And so what are the, some of the things that we can do just as, as a, what are some of the things that Guy can do as a CTO to help, 
help those teams is one is the amount, the basically the frequency of releases. Right. So at Tide, I'm really proud that, you know, every week we ship a release to iOS and Android, right? Mm -hmm. Every week. Just that's every on week. a weekly basis. That's, that's just a standard. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Every week we ship. Um, on the back end services and web, we actually can ship every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're a team and you're trying to get your feature live or you're trying to get your code live, you don't have a constraint on waiting for a quarter or mm -hmm. waiting for some long regression cycle. The team is really empowered to ship whenever they want. That's one. Secondly, is that we want to basically deliver code in increments. So we are data driven at Tide and hypothesis. No one at Tide knows what our members wants. So what we have to do is we have to ask them. And the right. way to ask them is to basically provide prototypes and provide mocks and provide questions to them about what features they actually want and then derive that data and look at the data and then incrementally polish the feature over a period of sprints to basically establish that, that to get to that place where you're really satisfying that member. In many ways, you know, you never get done, right? Because you're always improving, you're always optimizing mm -hmm. in this iterative, very scientific hypothesis-based mm -hmm. approach to derive the data. And it's just a never ending loop. So I'm really excited about that because at Tide, you know, we don't want to be centrally controlled. We don't mm -hmm. want to be top down driven. You know, we certainly have an OKR process. We've got a strategy, but in terms of the business areas and the autonomous, the autonomy that they have, we're really into that. And we really want them to be self-directed. And, and for me, getting those teams autonomous and getting those teams self-directed in terms of their backlogs with their product managers, being able to drive that innovation for the members, that's just so satisfying. It's so satisfying to see that. But it, every day we work on that, right? That's It's not easy to get that. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not easy to sustain it, but we're we're committed to getting there and we get better all the time. And, you know, I, if I think about over the last, Valentina, the last two plus years that I've been here, yeah. from where, where, when I came to where we are now, it, we're light years better, but we still have so much more to do and we can still get so better. I think also- For me as well, right? Yeah. And I, I, for me, like the, the, I think the key for, for it all is humility. Mm, okay. Right. Yeah. It's it, yeah. it's humility. It's like knowing that we don't know, and being okay asking our members, mm -hmm. and being data driven to get those answers. Mm. It's it's really not any more complicated than that. At Thai, we really try to leave the ego at the door. Mm. We don't we don't like assholes, right? Yeah. We don't we don't like know it alls. We yeah. want we we want it really. We want a direct relationship with our members, and we want to basically have our members tell us what we need to deliver. Absolutely. And I think you, you touch base on something very important in our company culture. I think we really value independence and also low egos with like a high, high interest in, in teamwork and sharing. Yes, and I, I think this is very important. We'll get to that a bit more in a bit more detail in a minute. What I wanted to ask you, because you, you've touched uh, on very important notions at Tide, you know, such as empowering and and also uh, independent, uh, independency, right, of, of the team. And I think this is something very interesting. And I think that the, hopefully uh, we, we do still have a bit of time, but could you tell us maybe quickly what life is like for for engineer at Tide, just just in terms of, you know, if anyone is looking to to join the engineering team, what they yeah. could, uh, wait for, and maybe we want to cover as well what kind of tech we use because I think it it does impact, you know, what a life of an engineer is at Tide, the tech we use. Yeah. So so I think first first of all, life as an engineer in Tide is we run on AWS, right? We run mm -hmm. cloud native. All of our infrastructure, all of our code runs in the cloud. And we're very happy with AWS, right? We're, we're the, they're a great strategic partner, and we really, we really, really enjoy working with them. So we're heavily vested in that. And AWS, what they do, not only do they provide compute, but they also provide services. And we, we consume those services, the AWS services that power our technology mm -hmm. um, a lot. We're fully a uh, microservices-based environment. So let me explain what that means for people who aren't technologists. Okay. Is in the good old days, right, you would have a client and you'd have a server. Mm -hmm. And then in that server, you'd have a database. And Valentina, how it would work is, you know, you've probably seen this. There would be an app and you could basically log in, right? Mm -hmm. And you could basically, um, you know, correspondingly, you know, see... Um, 
uh, you know, see the activity. At Tide, what we do to power a lot of that, right, uh, is we have microservices. So what we do is we've got individual services mm -hmm. where the data lives with that little service and it has APIs on front of it. And then what we do is you bind together all those microservices together to basically get the outcome that the member needs in terms of those services. Mm -hmm. And we do domain-driven design at Tide. So we've got really structured domains, technical domains, so that those APIs and the API boundaries are really contained within each of those, those corresponding boundaries of APIs. The technology that we use is we use uh, Java Spring Boot for mm -hmm. that. We use Python. We use, um, we use Flutter and Dart. We use Swift. We use... Uh, Android, we use Java. I mean, we, 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 use, we use a lot, but primarily it's Java and Python on the back end. Um, and we are thinking and experimenting with maybe utilizing some functional programming languages. We have some engineers that, as an example, have done Golang. Mm -hmm. And um, they're thinking about maybe, we're thinking about maybe exploring that. And then also we're really leaning into uh, Q1, we're gonna be pushing it is basically what we call BFF back end to front end so that the teams can be a little bit more full stacky. Um, in other words, the team itself has more autonomy. And with that, we want it, we're looking at Apollo, right? Uh, with Node.js. And uh, so those are some of the things that we're adding. We, interestingly enough, Valentina, we are very small G governance at Tide. So if you've been into a large company, like yeah. a, a big company, oftentimes new technology, new technology choices, oftentimes take years, right? At Tide, we do- It needs to go through loops and loops and loops of approval, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At, Tide, at Tide, we, we've got a, we, we inverted it. So we do a thing mm -hmm. called tech, we do the thing called tech radar and the Tide, the teams themselves, they, are, they can basically try whatever they want. Right. And then what we do is then quarterly, we look at what the teams are doing and only when the adoption starts to increase, do we try, do we govern it? And, and then we have this really active discussion and debate that's at the team level about those technology choices. And right now, I'll just be honest, like we've got a big debate going on about do, utilizing additional languages and they, it just continues. And I think Node.js is really, really picking up steam. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the BFF pattern with Apollo is really, really picking up steam. And I think we're going to really lean into that in Q1. Mm -hmm. And then and then the other part of the equation is the data science, right? It's the machine learning data science stack. And that's really, really active, right? Getting machine learning models to production, getting them live is really difficult, but that's a huge area of investment for Tide. We're, we are really, really investing in, in machine learning and data science because we want the teams to be autonomous. We basically take the data, the production data that we have, we push it into Snowflake, and then we run Looker on top of it. And with the reason why we do that and we invest so heavily in it is we want the teams to be able to go see, see the data, mm -hmm. um, answer the questions from a hypothesis perspective. We use things like segment to gather the data in terms of um, the members and the products and features that they're utilizing. Um, and it's, you know, for us, anything that reinforces that hypothesis based approach to engineering and product and product engineering, we're into and we really, really embrace it. Yeah, and I can't pretend I know all the languages you know you you you've mentioned and and uh, you know if if you have more questions about this as well, please um, you watching us live, please do put it in the comments. But what I really take away from this is once again it goes back to servant leadership, doesn't it? Because it is really about trusting the teams if they want to use you know this new language, this new tech, you enable them and you empower them to to go ahead and give it a go, which I think is uh, is truly uh, exciting. Right. And what we try to do is we try to uh, we try to lean into really defining what good looks like. Mm. And we really lean into standards around definition of ready and definition of done. And as long as the team can meet those conditions of production readiness, mm -hmm. we're fine. Also, the teams from a service catalog, going back to the domain driven design structure that we have, the teams in terms of the domains and the services that run the microservices that run, those are bound to teams. And the team owns the responsibility for those services in production. So we, you know, the team really has end-to-end -end responsibility of those experiences. And that means dog fooding. And what dog fooding is that, you know, we 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 take care of the production incidents, we care take care of the member-facing defects. 
um, we really lean into this at Tide because it really matters. Mm. I, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but one way you can basically give the most time back to your members is to have software that's not buggy, mm. right? That's yeah, really yeah. Not, not, that, that's defect free. It's Absolutely. kind of, I, I think we kind of take that for granted these days because software has gotten a lot better. And mm -hmm. we also are aware that, you know, like when you have a bad experience with software, you know that it's pretty painful, right? You know mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you, you basically see that as something being really negative. That's mm -hmm. why at Tide, we really try to basically eliminate any member facing defect. Absolutely. And I think um, I was watching an interview that Oliver, our CEO, did the other day, and he was talking about connectivity and how people today just assume connectivity is going to be available to them. I think we are in an area where we just want everything to work seamlessly and we expect it to work. So I, I think it's definitely having a non-buggy service definitely helps our members uh, saving time and money on their businesses. Um, and, and it's fantastic that it's one of our main focus, right? This is what we want to achieve. Um, just because I'm conscious of time, there is there is a point I really want to ask you because also I've seen a few uh, a few people commenting that they've applied and that they are um, looking to join the team in India. Um, I can see a few comments about not hearing back. As I was saying at the very beginning of this live, please do bear with us in the process. The amount of uh, you know applications we are getting a month. Um, I, Lisa mentioned in our last LinkedIn Live, it was 30,000 application a month. Um, that was the numbers from September. It might have grown since then. So please do bear with us. We The team is really uh, working very hard to get back to everyone. Um, but once again, there is going to be a 0.3% uh, you know, of applicants uh, actually jo joining us. So please do bear with us. But um, something I, I wanted to ask you around you know, our launch in India, okay, because that's so exciting. That's such a huge step for us mm -hmm. um what are you excited about in our you know international first uh launch yeah so um so first of all i i've spent a lot of time in india so i think um you know i've ran engineering engineer centers in bangalore um in the delhi area in uh hyderabad area right many many times so i've worked for brands like valtech in bangalore uh, in Hyderabad for Ivy CompTech of part of the BWIN party group, right? I was the global CTO and CPO there. So I, and I've probably been to India 60 times, something like that, right? Wow. I mean, I, I've really, really traveled extensively in India. I love India, right? I love India. I love the culture. I love the food. Um, it's been really hard on me personally in uh, C19 that I haven't been able to get back to India for business, right. but also, also for some really just some of my clear dear friends um i haven't been able to see them and and share share a meal with them and spend time with them mm. so i'm really looking forward to getting back to india in the new year um you know it's re i really wanted to try to get there this year so that's that's just on the personal side um the the reason why i'm so excited about india in from the uh business perspective is that for a long time and i think the, the indians on this call will really this will really resonate with them for a long time, India was basically a software service center, right, for companies that were doing work and doing services in like the U.S. or Europe, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, that's, that's really, and what's happened in the last, it started about 10 years ago, and it just gets more and more momentum, is now you have a lot of Indians that might have lived somewhere else and they've come back to India, or there are Indians who have come through the university, the great universities that are in India, phenomenal schools that come through those schools and as opposed to taking a job and leaving india they're staying or people are coming back and what's happening is they're building out this incredible startup scene and fintech mm -hmm. scene in india and it's so great to see so for tide the the you know what what we're doing is we're launching a brand in india and then for our indian colleagues that work for tide it's really exciting because you're working on a global platform so our ambition mm -hmm. is is to, we've got a business, very substantial business here in the UK. We're going to grow a really, really massive business in India. It's like, get ready, because this is like a rocket that's going to go off, right? And mm -hmm. we're going to basically get after it. And our mission is to serve those long tail and those SMEs in every one of those markets. And to do that with one contiguous code base, one contiguous product engineering platform, and utilizing configuration to serve that and being API centric in terms of how we deliver it. 
getting, and the reason why I bring that up is it really explains how we exercise what Oliver was talking about, connectivity chains. Absolutely. You can't make, you can't make those connectivity chains without two things, APIs and data. Mm. And so mm. at Tide, we're really focused on those APIs and we're focused on that data as a point of strategy and focus. And so as a CTO, it's so nice to be as part of this exec team and working with this great board. It's mm -hmm. so exciting because they understand the importance of technology. They, they understand the importance of how the technology can enable the right. business and how we can use that to grow. And it's just really, really fun to be part of that journey. And as it relates to India, right, it's so exciting because the market there is 56 million SMEs. Yes. It's, you know, as about as many small businesses as there are people in the UK. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so it's, it's a massive market. Um, we're really excited about it. And also the culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the fintech thing is just really starting to catch on in India. And I think that momentum is going to increase. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be such an honor and privilege to be part of that and to provide really good services for people that wouldn't have normally have access to those services. I think that's mm -hmm. really, really exciting. Absolutely. And I, I, I think as well um, as um, it, it, at, at a team level, just having the opportunity uh, to, to, to work with so many different colleagues and to have the opportunity to work with our Indian colleague, just, uh, it, it just gives us uh, another you know, perspective on the SME scene in India and just different cultures. And we do have this, this you know, great chance in London, especially to have this kind of like multicultural uh, environment. I'm French myself, you're American. We have loads of different cultures in the team, but I think having, you know, our our team as well in India, it just creates uh, some some fantastic collaborations really. Yeah, and, and then also too, we have an engineering center in Sofia, Bulgaria, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, we've got some engineers that um, have joined us from Romania, from the Ukraine, uh, France, Germany, UK, US, India. You know, we really have, um, I think also too, Valentina, it's really important to mention our work from work from home or work remote policy. Mm -hmm. um, at Tide, one thing we did is in C19, literally Oliver called me on a Friday and he said, Monday, everyone's gonna be out of the office guy. We need to be ready. And you know what? We were ready. Every, all of our customer service reps, everyone, because we're digitally native, mm -hmm. we just didn't, we didn't miss a beat. And we've really embraced this. We don't really, it doesn't matter to us where you are. You know, you could, our engineering center is in, in Hyderabad, but you could be in Mumbai. You could be in Bangalore. You could be in the Ukraine. You could be in France. You could be in Germany. You could be in Edinburgh, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter to us. What matters is that you fit the culture. I think first, I think that's mm -hmm. the first thing. The second thing is the skills, right? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm just, because you mentioned this and this is, you know, mentioning as well, people looking to potentially join. Let's jump in the questions because I'm aware of time. Okay. This was, uh, you know, uh, packed with information. Thank you so much for, for sharing so much. Um, let's take a first question from Pavan. Um, who is asking, um, hi, I'm eagerly waiting for an opportunity like this. But everyone asks for experience. If no, uh, gives a change from where I can get experience. I think it, 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 it'd be interesting to ask you, Guy, what's the opportunities uh, for junior developers at Tide? Yeah, so, yeah, so we are um, at Tide. We've got um, basically kind of seven levels of engineering. And mm -hmm. at that kind of junior level, um, we've been trying to build up enough capacity, expertise, and senior level so we can actually absorb some of that. So what we're doing is we're piloting a program with um, 20 juniors, right? We call, you know, basically on that first rung of the ladder, we call an A1 mm -hmm. um, to basically in like a six month mentoring type program. And we're going to pilot that in India. Um, we're going to kick that off in Q1. So that's something we're going to try. We're going to basically, I think it's about 10 to 20 of those type of individuals right. that we want to do. Um, I think in India, we call them freshers, um, basically newly graduated or just a little bit of experience. Um, so we're going to try that. So we, we want to do that. We wanted to do it sooner, but we didn't have that seniority in our Hyderabad Engineering Center. Now we've got more of that seniority, so we've got some capacity to do it. I think everyone should be empathetic that, Tide, you know, we're still pretty small, mm -hmm. right? I mean, from an engineering perspective, we're at 260 people. 
and you know, to mentor someone correctly and to do it well, it takes a lot of time. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a huge time commitment. But we know that that needs to be part of our strategy because if you grow people and they grow with you, um, it can be really, really a positive experience for them. I think the other point that's really important is about our, our job development, our growth framework at Tide. Mm-hmm. We're really employee-centric in terms of that growth framework. In other words, we really ask those hard questions in the interview about, okay, salary, that's great, but where do you see yourself in three years? Where do you see yourself in four years? Mm -hmm. Because we want people that are aligned in terms of our mission and purpose. If people want to come to Tide because they want to just make more money and then get their CV and then move on, we really don't want those people. We really want people that can be with us for a sustained period of time and can grow with us. We also have some interesting things going on too, where we have flexibility within Tide. Mm-hmm. So you could you could come in as an engineer and move to a product. You could come yeah, in as a product easy. and move to an engineer. You could go. We have people who've been in de- product and have moved to design. We have people in design going to product. Um, I think that those things are really good because Tide, what matters to us is that you get Tide. Mm-hmm. And if you have that trust and you have that kind of confidence in us, we're going to take that time to invest in you and then grow you so that you can meet your career objectives. And if those two things align, it's really pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I think we do have an incredible focus and in, in more and more as we get older as a company on uh, we have a big focus on growth and on keep on, you know, enabling our team to, to keep on learning. And, you know, we have different um, apps for that and, and to to really enable the team to learn what they want to be growing into in the career, which is which is really great. Um, and, and hopefully Pavan, this this answered your question, but but you know I, I uh, this is fantastic uh, to hear from you guys that we are launching this program because I, I really uh, understand and hear you, Pavan, when you say uh, that uh, if everyone asks for experience, you know the, the, at least one employer needs to give the first chance. So completely yeah. hear you here. Um, let's move on to uh, the next question. Uh, hopefully that goes on the screen. Yes, from Tim. Uh, how do you create enable journeys for individual business domain? Um, how do you lead on experience versus follow? So um, the second part of the question, let me answer that first, um, mm-hmm. Tim, is that you know I, I think you have to lead by example. So you, you can't really ask a team to do something that you're not willing to do yourself, right? Um, and I think that gets down to this really this issue around sustainability. I think in COVID and the last you know, tw- tw- you know 20 months, it's been really trying. I think one thing, one lesson out of that is that um, it's not just enough to have a place to work. It needs to be a place that where the culture is healthy and where different styles of working are okay. And different, you know, if you don't want to come to the office, that's okay. If you're somebody who likes to crank in the afternoon, that's okay. Right. I mean, we all have these different styles. So my point is that Tide, we're really trying to be outcome based, right? We're really, really trying. And I've got a long story, a great example, but it would just eat up all the time. The first part of the question in terms of enable journeys for the business domains, that's really tough, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, domain driven design and those type of concepts about how to bind an experience at the pixel level uh, so that it's seamless for the member across those domains. I think that's really critically important. APIs, right? Having good mm-hmm. APIs and having those APIs consumable so that if you have a team and you've got a you're consuming a service from another domain that's outside of their domain, like let's say you know, business services and you link into banking and you want to basically consume that, you got to make sure that you're you're really good practice around internal open source and really good hygiene with those APIs Mm -hmm. so that you're practicing internal open source. So any team can make a PR request against anyone else's service and basically say, hey, I need you to make this change. Now, the team that's responsible for those services makes approves and does the sign off on the change because they own that in production, right, for for, for that. Um, but I think those type of patterns, we're getting better at those at Tide, mm-hmm. and we're continuing to develop it as we scale more and more. We've got about 125 microservices in production. If you look at the next 12 months, that will triple potentially. So, you know, the, 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 the hygiene on the domains and the hygiene on the services, it's got to get much, much better or mm-hmm. else we, we create a, a system, an ecosystem that's maybe too complicated. Right. right. Um, so so we're, we're working on that. Fantastic. And uh, just to to go back to um, the beginning of uh, Tim's question, well, no, the the second part, you know, um, 
because you touched based on work-life balance, Guy, and I, I'd like to add myself a question. So um, if you could just, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I'd be very interested if you could just tell us a bit more about how you achieve that, because you mentioned a very important point. We are uh, focused uh, on results at Tide. We're not focused on, are you at your desk from nine to six? You know, we are really wanting to enable our students, our, our colleagues to lead uh, a healthy, balanced life uh, uh, in order, because I also personally think that's where you produce your best work, of course, and uh, and 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 because it's important. Um, what's your what's your take on work life balance, and do you think you've achieved it? Yeah. So uh, you know, first of all, have I achieved it? No. Um, okay. You know, uh, you know, I'm I'm a bad example of somebody who's kind of a classic workaholic, right? Mm -hmm. but, but that's not the standard, right? I'm not the standard. So, um, but I do. Valentina, you know, and I, I do this a lot. I just, you know, I'm, I, to basically shield that behavior, I have pretty formal times where I just cut off and I stop doing Slack and I'm not available. I might still be working, right? Mm -hmm. I might be reading, I might be designing something, I might be looking at some code, I might be consuming some APIs, but I'm doing that in a context that it's my time. It's my choice. I'm making that right. choice to basically do that. Um, in terms of work-life balance, you know, I'm a I'm a yoga pr practitioner. I've been riding my bike into the office, commuting on the bike three days a week, which is oh, really really great. nice. Mm. Um, I've been uh, trying to be much more disciplined about not um, working so much on the weekends of really mm. having that time. But I think that the the big thing, I mean, that's just about me. But the big thing I can say about Tide is that, you know, with, you know, Oliver, the CEO, who's my boss, or, you know, the board or my colleagues, you know, Lisa or Ian, the CFO, or the teams um, are very respectful about those personal time, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we, we're outcome based. In other words, we don't want to be descriptive, Valentina, and say, you have to work these hours, and this is mm -hmm. how many hours you work. We really want people to be the team, again, the team, not the individual, but the team to be directed in terms of achieving the outcomes that we need for Tide. Yeah. And um, if the team can do that, you know, in a pretty sustained way of, you know, 40 hours a week, rock on. That's great. Yeah. But, but then if they need that time to, to basically spike because they've got a big deliverable and they need to do that for a week or two weeks, Good. They do that, but they do that in a self-directed way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's the culture that we're really trying to get. We want that extreme ownership. Mm -hmm. We want that passion. And and mm -hmm. for a, for the most part, I think we see it. And at the same time, we don't want to do the micromanagement. We don't want to be caustic with people. Oh, you're not at your desk, or oh, you weren't available on Slack at 6 p.m. Like we I, we just don't care about that. It's just yeah. not important to us. It's not mm -hmm. important. Yeah, and, and I, I think it's down to trust as well, uh, right? And I think uh, trust is the opposite of micromanagement. And I think we, we do have a lot of trust and and, and ownership at, at Tide, which is uh, which is truly something um, that, that we practice every day and that we see uh, in, in many teams. Um, so, you know, I think it's a great way to, to, to end this uh, LinkedIn Live because hopefully this gives you, everyone watching us right now, a bit of a behind the scene and a bit of a flavor as to a company culture and how we work really. Um, so um, thank you again so much, uh, Guy, for uh, joining us today, answering all this question, giving so much details, you know, into what it's like to be an engineer at Tide and uh, what's coming next for us. Uh, thank you so much for everyone that watched us. Thank you as well. And uh, once again, all our positions are on our careers page. You can have access to, to all of the description there. Um, we do have many uh, remote uh, work positions, as Guy mentioned, during, during the live. So we'd love to see you apply. Do please bear with us. We are getting a, an incredible number, which is very exciting, but it means the team has to go through each of them. So please do bear with us. And thank you again for um, being live with us today. And thank you, Guy. Thank you again for being with us today. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, Valentina. Merci. <laughs> Bonne journée. Au, See au you guys revoir. later. Au revoir. Ciao. 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 Thank you.